Okay, we might get started then. Excellent. My name's Angela. I work at Onkfinger Libraries and today I'm joined with Eve, who is also from Onkfinger Libraries. Hello. And Tanya Blanchard, our guest speaker today. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you very much for having me. Hi. We are um, going to record this, so there'll be a recording available on our website later. And if you would like to ask a question of Tanya throughout the presentation, uh, please click on the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. If you can't see it, hover your mouse over there and it'll pop up. Um, and Eve will ask all the questions at the end. If you would like to um, read Tanya's books, we've got copies in the library available. Um, you may have to place holds on some of the titles. You can do that in person, you can do it over the phone, or you can do it on our website. You can also purchase the book through Dimmix at Glenelg. They've been wonderful in supplying um, copies of all our online author talks. So you can catch up on all of the books if you want to own your own copy with Dimmix down at Glenelg. It's a nice day for a walk down there too, nice and sunny in Adelaide. And I'd also like to thank Simon and Schuster for allowing us um, to have Tanya here with us today. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tanya, who has a bit of a presentation for us to start with. Thank you, Tanya. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Eve and Angela. Um, welcome to everyone in South Australia. Glad the weather is beautiful there today. I'm up in Sydney at the moment and the weather here is gorgeous too. A bit of a taste of summer. Um, so Letters from Berlin. Um, it's my third book and um, I was very, very excited to write this book and I couldn't wait for it to be released and out on the shelves and out in the world because it's, it's a really great story. So I'll just now um, set up my slideshow for you. Okay, we'll go back. Oops, a daisy. Hang on a minute. Let's try again. Sorry, guys. Right. No. It's always the way with technology, isn't it? Never Perfect. does what you want. And now not. <laughs> okay, here we go. No, see, for some reason it's not going back to the beginning. Okay, <laughs> we're right. Very good. I've got my lovely personal assistant, my daughter here, giving me a bit of a hand um, to get through this tech stuff. This is the first time I've presented over Zoom, um, so please bear with me. We might have a few little things to iron out, but um, here we go. Okay. So, um, look, I've always been intrigued by family stories and how they fit into our history. I grew up listening to my German grandmother tell us about her life in Germany during World War II and the Allied occupation about her family's migration to Australia in the 1950s and their early days in Sydney. She was always larger than life to me, and I knew that one day I wanted to tell her story, which resulted in me writing The Girl from Munich and Suitcase of Dreams. So this is a slide of my grandmother as a young woman, and it's my favorite photo of her. As you can see, she's, she's gorgeous. Okay, and this slide here is, shows my first two books, The Girl from Munich and Suitcase of Dreams, which follows my grandmother's story. So while researching the girl from Munich and sifting through the documents, photos and memorabilia that my German grandmother left behind after she died, I discovered a letter that started the journey to letters from Berlin. The letter had been sent to her when she was in her 80s by newly connected relatives in Germany. They'd been trying to find other branches of the family that had dispersed after the war and they'd found my grandmother's cousin, recently returned to Germany after spending nearly 40 years living in South America where his mother's family had migrated in the early 1900s. Um, so this, this is actually a photo of my grandmother's cousin um, that came with the letter. Um, so you can see on the left there that he's a, the young boy with his mother and as an old man. 
So that, they were pretty awesome photos to find as well. So he wrote them a short letter in response to their inquiry about his family. He remembered meeting my grandmother's brothers on their way to the war. They went to the Eastern Front, never returning. They perished there on the Eastern Front. He lost contact with the family after his father's death. It was wonderful to, to discover a part of my grandmother's family that I knew nothing about, but the icing on the cake was the copy of a German newspaper article that accompanied the letter. This is the article, it was in German. I had no idea what it was about until I began translating it. Thank God for Google Translate. The article blew my mind. It briefly covered the story of this cousin's family from the 1920s through to the late 1940s. So the war years in Germany and into the Soviet occupation. The reason his story was so sensational was because he was involved in a landmark legal case in Germany in an attempt to reclaim property lost to his family at the end of the war. The legal case took over 20 years from first lodgment, reaching the Supreme Court in Germany. The final verdict was a resounding victory, handed down when he was lying in hospital. His courage, determination and persistence finally paid off. He died, unfortunately, two weeks later. Besides being an incredible story, the amazing thing for me was to learn more about my family. I discovered that my grandmother's uncle was married to a Jewish woman originally from Russia. So that's a, that's a photo that came with the letter as well of my grandmother's uncle and his wife. So this uncle owned a large estate outside of Berlin and was predominantly a timber merchant. His wife's name was added to the Register of Jews in 1943, sparking off a series of events that changed their lives, despite all he had done to protect them from Nazi persecution. I couldn't believe everything this family, my relatives had endured. It's such an incredible story full of heartbreak, survival and human endurance that made me immensely proud. And I knew immediately that I wanted to tell their story. Letters from Berlin is inspired by the life of my grandmother's cousin and follows the story of a mixed marriage family, Jewish and German during World War II Germany and into the Soviet occupation. Set in and around Berlin, Susie's world is turned upside down when Elia, her godmother and guardian, has finally been placed on the official register of Jews and must now wear the Star of David. Her godfather, Georg, has been able to protect Elia and their son, Leo, through good relationships with prominent Nazis until now. When a family friend and influential Nazi offers to help protect Elia and Leo, Susie jumps at the chance. She'll do whatever she can to protect her family and the man she loves. As they turn to the resistance to thwart the Nazis in any way they can, and the risk to Elia and Leo escalates, Susie learns how far she'll have to go to keep her family safe. Unlike the previous novels where I had wonderful family stories, photos, documents and memorabilia to draw on, with letters from Berlin, all I had to begin with was that letter and the German newspaper that accompanied it. Unfortunately, uh, because his cousin's case was so high, pro high profile, his story and the progress of his legal case was actually reported in a number of German newspapers over the years. Thankfully, there, was, there were enough details about the significant moments in his and his family lives that I could research further, investigating the historical events surrounding these moments. I was able to gather additional detail from census information and immigration records from the Ancestry website, corroborating the newspaper articles. I drew on fascinating first-hand accounts of the time from books and biographies, a fabulous array of information from the internet, thank God for the internet. I watched lots of documentaries and returned to my trusted tomes written by historians about World War II. Research provided further layers to the story and helped build a picture of what family and legacy meant in the climate of the Third Reich. And in 1943, with Germany's first big loss in the war on the Eastern Front at Stalingrad and the final solution well underway, what extent people were prepared to go to protect the ones they loved. Using the pivotal experiences of this family as anchor points in the novel, I was able to join the dots to construct an authentic story, weaving fact and research about what their lives might have been like with fiction to bring this family story to life. 
Letters from Berlin is told from the perspective of a fictional foster daughter of Georg and Elia. The facts I had provided the scaffold for the novel and the fictional storyline of Susie and Julius have added layers to the story of war, to the exploration of how this group of people experienced the war and to what extent people were prepared to go to protect the ones they loved. I wanted to tell this story from a female's point of view, an ordinary German girl looking in at the war experienced by a rarely mentioned group of people, those Jewish people married to Germans in mixed marriages and their children who were considered Mischling, half-breeds, like my grandmother's cousin. I knew no virtually nothing about this group of people and how they survived the Holocaust and navigated their way through the war. According to the Holocaust Encyclopedia, in 1933, the Jewish population in Berlin was about 160,000. Berlin's Jewish community was the largest with more than 32% of all Jewish people in Germany. Many emigrated through the 1930s due to the Nazi persecution and Berlin's Jewish population fell to half, about 80,000 by 1939. By October 1941, Jewish Berliners were being deported from Nazi Germany to the Eastern ghettos, the largest being Warsaw and Lodz. By 1942, these ghettos began to be liquidated, with their inmates deported to extermination camps such as Auschwitz, Belzec and Treblinka, and many Jewish people still within the Third Reich were deported directly to such camps in the East. The deportations from Berlin ended by April 1943. The city was empty of the Jews. More than 60,000 had been deported from Berlin. Only a very small number remained in Berlin and survived the war, some in hiding, but the majority were in mixed marriages. As you can see in this slide, this is um, this is actually a poster uh, that came with the Nuremberg race laws in 1935, showing the various classifications of Jewish um, heritage. So there were people with uh, no Jewish background, uh, those who had one Jewish grandparent, two Jewish grandparents, three, and then four Jewish grandparents meant you were a full Jew. So Jewish, Jewish so German law protected Jewish spouses in mixed marriages, even with the new Nazi laws and rulings. So the Nuremberg Laws of 1935 redefined race law, persecuting those who had Jewish blood, rescinding their German citizenship and forbidding marriage or relationships with Germans. There were so many rulings that arose out of these laws, especially after Kristallnacht, the night of the broken glass. That was in 1938, where Jewish synagogues were torched, businesses vandalized and many Jewish people arrested. Although Jews were no longer allowed to marry Germans, there were many mixed marriages that already existed and the laws were not retroactive. Many couples were pressured to divorce, but many didn't. Jewish women who were married to German men and who did not practice their faith and baptize their children as Christians, usually Lutheran, like my relatives, were considered to be in privileged marriages, which allowed them the status and privileges of a German family, including full rations, being allowed to stay in their homes and not wearing the Star of David. However, unprivileged marriages, Jewish men married to German women or with children brought up in the Jewish faith, although still protected to some extent, were treated less favorably. Many in such families lost their jobs and were ostracized by their community, friends and even family. Christian children with a German father were also considered German citizens. But as the war began and then escalated, the restrictions on this group rose. Already forbidden to have a relationship or marry a German, they were then unable to join the military and attend university among other restrictions. But by 1943, when my story begins, all bets were off and everything changed. The final solution to rid Germany and Europe of the Jews was underway. And as the end of the war and Germany's loss loomed closer, the more desperate the Nazis' attempts to ensure no Jews were spared became. So although not an immediate threat of deportation to the Eastern ghettos and extermination camps of occupied Poland, their lives were tenuous and the threat to their very survival was a real and present danger. By autumn 1944, there was a major drive to recruit Mischling or half Jews into the labor camps 
to supply forced labour for the Nazi civil engineering and construction projects. These included building roads, runways for airports to support the new jet aircraft that were being rolled out, bunkers for major communication hubs for the Nazi leadership and building armaments factories. Thousands of half Jews received their national labour service letters, compelling them to present themselves to collection centres. Conditions of the camps were similar to concentration camps and the workers were treated as slave labour. Many perished due to the hard conditions and the hard work. Understanding the background of my grandmother's cousin's family and all that they had been exposed to in Nazi Germany, it made sense when I learnt that my grandmother's uncle was involved in the German resistance movement. He was part of an organisation called Free Germany, little known against the more famous acts of resistance within the White Rose, the group of university students from Munich who handed out anti-Nazi pamphlets and also the assassination attempt on Hitler by Klaus von Stauffenberg and supported by the military elite. I spoke about both of these particular acts of resistance in uh, The Girl from Munich. So I was intrigued to learn that there were no overarching united or coordinated resistance movement in Germany, like many other countries such as Italy, Poland or France. However, the National Committee for a Free Germany was founded in the Soviet Union and using radio broadcasts, pamphlets and newspapers, urged Germans to fight against the Nazi ideas and regime and promised a democratic Germany once the Third Reich was brought down. The resistance was supported by Stalin and Soviet Russia, who of course wanted a Germany free of Hitler and fascism. Free Germany brought together a loose collaboration of resistance fighters and groups, many with communist leanings, but also ordinary everyday people who believed that what the Nazis were doing to Germany and its people was wrong. It was while involved with Free Germany that my grandmother's uncle orchestrated the escape of Soviet POWs from the Sachsenhausen concentration camp, just north of Berlin, and in hiding child flak helpers, some as young as 12, who had deserted their posts at anti-aircraft positions across Berlin in the late stages of the war. I assume that my grandmother's uncle's connection to Russia through his wife had something to do with his involvement in this type of resistance. I only wish that there had been some family stories about this, but sadly there's nobody left to ask. Sachsenhausen was primarily a camp for political prisoners and dissenters to the Third Reich, especially communists, and many Soviet Red Army officers and soldiers were sent here from the Eastern Front. The Soviet soldiers were treated with brutality, the Russians cut to less than half than other prisoners, left starving with no warm clothes and beaten for no reason. The political commissars and any active Bolsheviks were singled out for the worst treatment. More than 10,000 were executed, shot with a single bullet to the head. Not even high profile prisoners like Stalin's son escaped such treatment. He was shot dead by Nazi guards one evening while taking his daily walk. <clears throat> Other Russian prisoners were involved in medical experiments, trialing various drug cocktails or gassed to death as the SS tried more efficient execution methods before the advent of the gas chambers used in death camps such as Auschwitz. I was very proud to learn of this family's resistance to the Third Reich and their commitment to help those persecuted by the Nazis. I wanted to learn more about other acts of resistance from the time my story starts. And I was fascinated to read about the Rosenstrasse protest in February and March of 1943. This was a peaceful protest by wives and mothers of about 2,000 Jewish men in mixed marriages and half Jewish sons who were rounded up in Berlin despite the protection of their marriages and detained. The last major deportation of Jewish people had just occurred with reports that these people had been sent straight to Auschwitz. These women wanted information about their men and stood silently refusing to leave in the face of being threatened with lethal force by police officers and guards with machine guns mounted on trucks outside the collection center. The men were all released from captivity by the 6th of March and most then survived the war. But the intentions of the Gestapo at this time have remained a contentious issue. It has been reported that these men were never in danger of being sent to Auschwitz or camps in the East, 
that they were in fact earmarked for labour camps across Germany. Interestingly, these men were released at a time when German morale and general faith in the Nazi government was low after the German losses on the Eastern Front at Stalingrad, and the Nazis couldn't afford another PR disaster. This was the first protest against deportation of the Jewish people, and the fact that these women protested in the face of violent reprisals and were not forcibly removed shows the power of resistance, especially at the right time, and the bravery of these women who stood up against the repressors. I had to include this in my story, and I've placed Susie amongst the action. Researching the role of child flak helpers, I learned that they were auxiliary helpers for the Luftwaffe personnel who manned the anti-aircraft flak towers across strategic and major city positions in Germany, and were essential in the defence against Allied air raids. These teenagers learned how to handle and move munitions and how to operate and man the anti-aircraft guns. I could only imagine what they went through as the Allied planes flew overhead and bombed parts of Berlin. There were three massive flat towers built across Berlin to protect the city. The one that captured my imagination was the Zoo Flak Tower at Tiergarten, which was the last flak tower to fall to the Soviets in April 1945. It was a huge concrete fortress built to protect the government district and situated within the parkland that surrounded the Berlin Zoo. Not only did it house the armaments for the rooftop anti-aircraft guns and the personnel to man them, but there was a bunker large enough to fit 15,000 Berliners and it accommodated an 85 bed military hospital on the third floor. On the second floor, a, control climate, a, a climate controlled room contained priceless artifacts from the city's museums and galleries. There was also capacity for a command facility for those in charge of the defense of Berlin. And this is where the headquarters of such Nazi leaders as Goebbels was situated. I couldn't help but find out more about the nearby Berlin Zoo and how it fared during the Battle of Berlin, the Allied bombings that commenced in November 1943. I discovered that the zoo was hit by a number of bombs which caused fires to break out across the zoo, burning the shelters of the elephants, monkeys and predators, and about a third of the zoo's animals perished, including seven elephants, a black rhino, a chimpanzee, an orangutan, giraffes, pygmy hippos, and half the antelopes and deer. Carcasses of dead crocodiles were found on the street outside the zoo, flung out after the explosion, and had either died from the blast or from the extreme cold. Rumours spread across the city of dangerous animals roaming the streets, but only a few monkeys, birds, and a dingo who was recovered escaped. Among the survivors was the gorilla Pongo, who had been in the zoo since 1936, and had appeared on the cover of the visitor's guide. But sadly, only one of the elephants survived in the badly damaged elephant shelter. Siam the bull survived the war, but lost his entire harem in that one raid. Kanalchki, the six month old bull hippo also survived and he became a crowd favorite, siring 35 offspring and lived a long life. While Siam the elephant and Kanalchki the hippo both remained at the Berlin Zoo for the duration of the war, many of the remaining animals were taken in by a number of generous zoos. Somehow, the Berlin Zoo remained open to the public until April 1945. I found that absolutely amazing. I had to include the Zoo Flat Tower and the Berlin Zoo in my story, and Susie again was placed within the action of these two fascinating places. Of course, I had to research about the Soviet occupation of Germany after the war and about occupation of Berlin. The Red Army arrived in Berlin and the eastern part of Germany in 1945 before the American and British forces. This area became the Soviet zone, which ultimately became East Germany in 1949. Major land reforms were initiated across the Soviet zone, where lands and agricultural assets belonging to active Nazi party members and leaders War criminals and those owning greater than 100 hectares were expropriated. Many properties were transferred to the soil fund by the Committee for Land Reform, broken into small allotments of about five hectares each, which were then redistributed to landless farmers, agricultural workers and refugees from Poland. 
Some were left as central state-run properties and cooperatives where resources, farm machinery and equipment were pooled and shared among the smaller holdings. This expropriation affected thousands of Germans who had ancestral estates that had been in their families for hundreds of years. They were expelled from their homes and became part of the massive displaced population that had been forced from part of Poland and Russia that had actually been Germany prior to the end of the war. When the Berlin Wall fell and Germany was reunified in 1990, part of the agreement between the Soviet Union and Germany involved no recourse for those German families whose properties had been expropriated by the Soviets. There was no chance for them to claim the property back or compensation for their loss, even after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 and the emergence of the Russian Federation. Connections to hundreds of years of family history were lost places where German families had lived, worked and died for generations. The Soviets reached Berlin first in April 1945 and stripped the city of anything useful it could use for reparations, sending it back to Russia. The war had already destroyed so much of Berlin, but still infrastructure like railways, transport and industry were dismantled, not just in Berlin, but across the Soviet zone, before the Americans and British took over their sectors in July 1945. Although surrounded by the Soviet zone, Berlin was split into Soviet, American, British and French zones, initially governed together in a unified Allied Control Council. But this soon deteriorated until each zone was governed independently. The Soviet sector, which eventually became East Berlin, suffered from lack of facilities and in this story, in, in this story, this is highlighted by the state of the hospital system, many being bombed out or dismantled. The city was a disaster area with poor sanitation, no electricity, heating, running water, and thousands of homeless. Refugees from the east flooded into Berlin and infectious diseases such as typhus, dysentery, tuberculosis, and typhoid fever began to arise, especially in the refugee camps. To make matters worse, Venereal disease was also on the rise after the frenzy of rapes on Berliner women and girls by Soviet soldiers in the final days of the war. However, penicillin was in short supply in the Soviet zone and the public health problems took quite some time to combat. And I certainly touch on this with Susie's nursing background in the story. This is ultimately a story about family and legacy what a family will do to stay together, what a family will do to protect its own. In the prologue and epilogue, Ingrid and Natalie living in Sydney learn about their family connections to Germany and Susie and read her letters which tell the story of her life, her legacy to them. It mirrors the legacy for me as I learnt about this branch of my grandmother's family and how I can now share their story with members of my own family. Like in The Girl from Berlin, the common theme run, running through the war years was of ordinary people doing extraordinary things in extraordinary times. And this is also found in Letters from Berlin. I'm proud to share this story and honour this family's memory. And I hope with this story to offer a perspective of the war that readers may not have seen before, giving insight into how those in mixed marriages and their children lived under the yoke of the Third Reich. But being a story about family and legacy, I know many readers will be able to relate to the experience of learning about family, especially with the fracture and dispersal of so many families across Europe after World War II. It's often after the generation who lived through the war has gone that their descendants want to learn more and search for pieces to their family's story, perhaps even discovering relatives across the world like I did, and maybe even bringing families back together in some way. I've been privileged to be able to share the stories of my family members. I've been delighted to hear from many readers who have similar family stories or those with similar backgrounds, who knew little about the times their parents or grandparents lived in and what their lives might have been like. And I feel privileged to be able to shed light on other people's stories too. I love that many have shared their own or their family stories. That's always a real honour. For me, as a writer and a lover of history, it doesn't get better than that. I think that fictionalising family stories allows us to bring our characters to life, make them flesh and blood, make them real and ordinary like the rest of us. 
And at the end of the day, I think that's what intrigues us the most. The lives of ordinary people touched by the events of their time. It's their very human and often inspiring actions and reactions that make us believe in humanity and help us understand who we are. Our ancestors' stories are their legacy and ours too. If we learn about them and share them, passing them on to future generations, we'll never forget their stories, who they were and, and where we in turn come from. Thank you very much. That was quite an amazing story. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously, your three books are sort of loosely based on your family yep. connection and your history, and you've done an amazing amount of extra research for them. Were, did you ever consider publishing them as non-fiction titles, like as a biography? Yeah, look, I guess the, the main problem with that was that I had lots of great details about all these family stories, but there were just so many gaps. I had all the, the main highlights of the big moments in their lives, but knew nothing about what happened in between those moments. And, and it was really like um, joining the dots to try and put the story together and imagine what their life might, might have been like. And so that's why I decided to fictionalise it, um, yeah, and, and uh, just put that imagined version with the research behind me into into the story yeah that's very true um can you and i suppose you've answered a little bit of this here can you um comment more on what it's like why it's important to remember the history and things that have gone before us well i think that we we can always learn something from from the history that has come before us um, especially with family stories, um, it, it's part of who we are. We can, we can understand a little bit more about where we've come from. Australia is such a multicultural country that there are so many stories out there, amazing stories about where we've originally come from, what's brought us to Australia, and, and really defines who we are as a nation today. And I think that's part of the importance of remembering this kind of history. Yes, I agree with that. Um, with um, growing up with that German, that rich German heritage, how did that influence how you were in Australia? Yeah, well, I actually um, come from a, a mixed background. So my mother is German and my father's Italian. So it was, um, it was kind of a little bit strange for me. I felt that I didn't really belong anywhere. I wasn't German, I wasn't Italian, I wasn't Australian growing up. Um, so I did feel um, a little bit um, in no man's land uh, in the schoolyard um, and, and growing up. But having said that, that rich German cultural history, I guess, did give me that sense of identity that I really, I really drew on as I grew up and particularly as an adult that I look back on with such nostalgia there, you know, all the beautiful food, the um, special events that were always celebrated with food and family gatherings. Um, they, they were really important to me. And as a child, you just take it for granted. Um, but it's not until you grow up and you look back, particularly with children of your own, that you realise how very important that was and how that you know, made you who you were. Do you think you will write about any other historical moments in time or Will you always try and keep it around your family? I think I'm, you know, I love family stories and I've done a little bit of research into my family and also into my husband's family. And um, so I will continue writing family stories, but they'll be from different periods of time, not always around World War II. Um, the next story I'm writing at the moment is still set around World War II, but set in Southern Italy. So coming from my father's background and heritage, which has been quite fascinating and very, very different to the German stories. Um, so I've learned a lot about that. But I will be writing another story after that, um, following part of my husband's heritage and when his part of his family came to Australia in 1914 uh, from England. So uh, the, the next story will be set in the late 1800s. Um, so a little bit different again. It certainly sounds like you've got lots of ideas to keep you going for a number of years. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
my last question before I hand over to Eve is I noticed in your biography, in your bio online that you um, attended lots of writing classes. Yes. And I wanted to um, explore how you feel that's helped you become a successfully published author. Um, yeah. How did that help? Yeah, yeah. Look, the first lot of courses I did were online courses with the Australian Writing Centre. And I guess I... I did those when my children were a bit younger and they were at school and I really couldn't get out at night and attend classes. But I found them really useful just to help me learn about how to, how to structure a story, how to improve characterization, how to improve dialogue and give me confidence in my writing skills because I don't come from a writing background at all. I'm, I'm an ex-physiotherapist, so no writing, no creative writing there anyway. Um, so they gave me great confidence to move forward with the story that I was writing at the time. And then I, I worked as much as I could on that until I found that I was stuck again. I couldn't really go any further, which is then when I went and did Fiona McIntosh's commercial uh, fiction masterclass in Adelaide for five days. And that was absolutely brilliant. Um, that took me in a slightly different direction again. Um, and Fiona, coming from a historical fiction background herself, um, was fabulous to talk to her about um, you know, going into fictional writing. Um, and, and because uh, I went to her class, there were these wonderful connections um, with being able to um, talk to publishers and pitch my story. And, and that was how I, I, um, got, I was picked up by Simon & Schuster. Um, I was very, very fortunate to be in the right place, the right time, with the right kind of story. And um, yeah, it was absolutely surreal when it happened. Are you a full-time writer now? You don't practice physiotherapy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> physiotherapy anymore, a full-time writer. I'm, yeah, it's wonderful to be able to say that, yeah. Excellent, that's an awesome story. I will pass over to Eve now, see if she's got any questions from the audience. Thank you, Angela. Thanks, Angela. It's always so interesting to hear people's journey to getting published. I think I could listen to stories like that all day. Um, we have had some questions come through. So um, in the new book, uh, Letters from Berlin, yeah, it's based on obviously letter writing. <laughs> um, and, I, and somebody's just written in to say, um, are you a letter writer yourself? Oh, used to be a letter writer. I don't think there are many letter writers left anymore. Um, I do no. write the letter, but these days it's all emails. And I think the art of letter writing is dying sadly. I know my children going through school were never really taught how to write a letter. And if ever they've had to write something, we've got to sit them down and go, radio. this is how you write a letter, a proper letter. But I actually had an old friend write to me recently on this beautiful, beautiful parchment paper in this gorgeous envelope with this calligraphy. Oh, it was magnificent. And that was such a special treat to receive this gorgeous letter. So there is nothing like letter writing. I honestly don't think I would know how to post a letter if I had to. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not very good, is it? <laughs> that's, that's where, that's our age. Yeah. Um, and I know that you touched on it a little bit before, but we'll still go into a bit more. Um, what are you working on now? Can you give us any sneak, sneak hints about any upcoming books or anything? I can. I am writing a novel at the moment um, set in southern Italy uh, just prior to World War II and going into World War II. Um, and it's based around my, my father's heritage, uh, his Italian heritage. Um, and it's been absolutely fascinating. I had no idea of what the history of Italy was during World War II, but in fact, they, they entered the war late, um, aligned with Germany, obviously. And then when the Allies invaded Sicily in 1943, it sent Italy basically into civil war. Um, and so that was a really fascinating journey to follow what Italians experienced through the war. It was quite varied and different to perhaps anywhere else in Europe. Um, so southern Italy is very, very ancient, lots of um, Byzantine and uh, Greek roots, um, steeped in superstition, very, very Catholic magnificent countryside, tall mountains that come almost to the sea. So it's an absolutely fascinating region to have explored and researched. And I can't wait to 
to put all of that into the story and give a really different perspective of the war experience from a Southern Italian. Oh, it sounds very exciting. Can't wait to read that one. <laughs> um, our next question is, who's your favourite author? Oh, my goodness. That's a really good question. Um, I have many favourite authors. Um, I love Diana Gabaldon, of course, with Outlander. Who doesn't love Outlander? The gorgeous Jamie and Claire. Um, so she's a favourite. I love the way she writes uh, beautiful, rich uh, scenes with lots of five senses, as, you know, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, the touch, all of it. It's, so she's, she's a great author. Um, she's one of my favourites. I love, um, oh, let me think, um, can't think of his name now, uh, Ken Foley, uh, Pillars of the Earth, the great historical epics. Um, yeah, so um, a lot of uh, historical writers, I guess. I was going to say, I can see a theme there. They're not, um, yeah. <laughs> they're not always easy books to tackle, those ones. Yeah, that's um, when you have plenty of time to, on yes. a holiday or something to read, yeah. I think, which is yeah. pretty well all the time, only time I get to read now, sadly. I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, and our last question is, what are you reading at the moment? Oh, what am I reading? Actually, what am I reading at the moment? I'm reading a lovely book called, oh, let me get this right, Codename Helene, I think. Um, about Nancy Wake. Um, it's, it's a great story. It's out at the moment. Um, and um, I'm reading a, a different perspective on what Nancy Wake's life was like as a resistance fighter during World War II. Um, so I'm really loving that at the moment. I've seen that one around. It does look like a good one. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tanya. I'm going to throw it back to Angela to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Eve. Excellent, thank you. That was thoroughly enjoy enjoyment. I really enjoyed listening to that today. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Angela. And I hope all the audience enjoyed it as well. Uh, we will send some feedback out, so um, look out for that in your email. You can actually you can give us the feedback. We're not giving you the feedback. And also, uh, if you want to follow any other online events, look on our website or on our Facebook page because we promote all our events there. And so thanks once again, Tanya, for joining us today. Thanks, Eve. It's been an awesome session to listen to. And um, have a great week. Thanks, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.